Welcome to the podcast series at the College of Education and Integrative Studies at Cal Poly Pomona. My name is Jeff Pass. I'm the Dean of the College. And we have here as our guests, uh, Dr. Taylor Albright from our Department of Educational Leadership. Welcome, Taylor. Thank you. Great to be here. And Rosario Emery. Uh, principal at Pomona Unified School District. Yes. And Stacy Ayers, who's an administrator with the Whittier School District. South Whittier School District. South Whittier School yes. District. Uh, welcome to you both. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to start off talking to Dr. Albright, and we're going to talk about school funding. And school funding is something that a lot of people don't know much about, but it's really, really crucial. Uh, how is that so? How is school funding crucial? Well, we need money to educate our young people, to support our teachers, to support our leaders. Um, California is among the last in the nation um, in terms of their per pupil funding um, for education. Um, and that has created a real challenge um, and a around how are we going to best support the equitable educational outcomes of our youth. Okay, so most school funding formulas are based on property taxes and thus more affluent communities would have more school funding. Uh, but sometimes that leads to inequities, doesn't it? Yeah, so school finance historically, like you said, has been based on local property taxes. Um, and so as a result, you end up with affluent districts with much greater amounts of funding. Um, so starting around in the 60s and 70s, there were a number of efforts happening at the state level in various states to try and address the issue of local level funding. Um, and so to make it more to equal, make it more equitable. Yeah, to make it more equitable. And so the way that worked in California, California was really one of the first states um, to start this movement with what were called the the Serrano rulings in the 1970s, um, in which they called for um, a more equal distribution of resources across districts. Um, now, how, how did that go over? Was the public upset about that? Yes. So there was a backlash to the Serrano rulings, which was really exemplified in a very controversial measure known as Prop 13, which a lot of people might be familiar with. Tell, remind us what it is, because yeah. there's so many different props. Prop 13, um, it's a complicated initiative, but sort of the, the quick summary would be that it really restricted the ability of local communities to raise property taxes. So as a result, it really restricted the community of local local communities to raise money for schools as well, as well as for other local initiatives. And so as a result of these several policies in California, school finance is largely determined at the state level, uh -huh. not at the local level. So that makes it more equitable because the state could do the distribution according to some fairer formula. Theoretically, yes. And so what happened sort of after these rulings was in order to try and achieve these equity related goals, we started seeing the state legislature doing a lot of what some district leaders might have considered micromanaging in the form of categorical funds. So the state would just say, you know, this little pot of money needs to be used for this purpose. This little pot of money needs to be used for this purpose. Because they, they didn't over, trust the districts yeah, to spend the money the way the exactly. legislators wanted it. Yeah, and so you ended up with over 60 categorical funds, and you had a lot of concern among educators that there was very little flexibility to attend to local community needs. And so that brings us to what was really like the most sweeping financial reform um, in the last 40 years in the state, which was called the Local Control Funding Formula, or LCFF, which passed in 2013. Local Control Funding Formula. It mm -hmm. passed the legislature, or was it an amendment? Uh... Passed the legislature, mm -hmm. so state-level policy, um, and Jerry Brown was elected governor, and he, he really shepherded this in as this was one of his kind of signature policy achievements during his tenure. And his goal uh, and the goal of the legislation was to make things more equitable so poor districts can have adequate funds to educate their children. Yeah, that was part of it. So a big part of it was around flexibility. So local control, there's more local control over how funds are spent. A number of categoricals were eliminated, and so there's more flexible spending. So therefore, an elected school board and their superintendent they hire can make the decisions that they feel are best for the district and not be encumbered by restrictions from the legislature or the governor's to office. To a greater extent, yes. Um, but and not, not 100%. Yes, not 100%. And um, there are some sort of eight statewide priorities that the funding needs to be spent in alignment to. So and give then, me an example of one of the priorities. Oh, uh, like safe facilities, okay. things like that. Yeah. Um, and Because some districts might spend too much on instructional and then ignore the facilities and then get themselves in trouble. 
Yeah, maybe. I, I'm, I, my sense was there was just kind of a sense of this need to be spent for you know educational expenses and sort of a loose framework of what that means okay. um, from the state. Um, but to your earlier point about equity, so the local control funding formula includes for every district a base grant that's based on enrollment, but also there are additional funds given to districts um, based on their enrollment of low-income students, English learners, and foster youth as an unduplicated count. So if student so, falls into one or more of those categories. So those three groups probably need a little more resources mm -hmm. to meet their needs, so therefore extra money is provided. Yeah, and that was the argument that the, the, the governor and the legislature put forward. I think Jerry Brown, I'm paraphrasing here, but he had a quote that was, um, equals treatment of students in unequal situations is not justice. Um, so there, And there was this construction of these three groups as being considered um, groups with higher needs and in need of greater resources. And so in that sense, the local control funding formula can be understood as an equity-oriented policy, and it contains within it a definition of equity, that equity is greater resources for those with greater needs. Um, there's another dimension to LCFF that I'd love to talk about, which is community engagement. All right. Um, so another component of the policy is that as part of the local control, the local control is not just district leaders in the school board, but also local control involving the community, including those targeted students and their families, low income students and their families, English learners and their families and so on. Um, and so the community, the district is required to engage the community in developing a plan that identifies what are the district goals and how are LCFF funds going to be spent in alignment with those goals and in service of those targeted groups. So it wouldn't just be the professional educators making the decision, it would be a community-based decision. Yeah, and in fact, all community members, not just stakeholders in schools, I mean, parents and students certainly are, are asked to be part of this, but all community members um, can be involved in LCAP. And school, the, the school districts are required to invite the entire local community um, in making these decisions. And so, and so I should say, the plan that is being developed is called the Local Control Accountability Plan. Um, it's commonly referred to as the LCAP. So if you ever get a notice from your school district saying, hey, come to the LCAP town hall, that, that's what this is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, they passed it and now everything's equal and everything's great. And we can move on to other issues. <laughs> Sadly, no. Um, so we're still so we're still behind where we need to be in terms of funding, right? There's been more funding, but there's still not enough. And there's there been are, more funding because the state has done well economically over the yeah, past. Yeah, and years. there were some propositions passed, sort of at, after the recession, that increased funding. LCFF sort of increased some funding, and and LCFF what it did is it restored school funding to the levels they had prior to the recession. Okay. Um, but it's still, you know, more is good, but we're still we're still short on the resources that we need to address um, to address all the needs of our students. And this is why we're seeing things like um, teachers unions going on strike, demanding more funds and districts saying we're do we're giving you everything we can. The issue is is largely happening with not enough funding coming at the state level. Um, and then in terms of the engagement piece, we're still finding, um, in polls, we're finding that most California voters are not being invited to these meetings. Um, and that attendance at these meetings is really quite low in a number of districts. And perhaps what's most concerning is the groups that are being targeted by LCFF funds, those groups are the most severely underrepresented in engagement and decision-making about those funds. So low-income communities and English learner communities in particular um, are having much less of a voice in decision about these monies um, as was intended by the policy. And why do you think that is? Why would they be mm -hmm. less involved? There are, there are a few reasons. One is a lack of resources and support for districts in terms of doing community engagement. Community engagement is hard to do. And we have community organizers who, you know, this is their entire career is reaching out to community. And all of a sudden we've asked districts who've never done this before in many cases to become community organizers. And that requires additional staffing, that requires additional professional development, that requires initial training. It also requires for many district leaders and many educators a belief change in terms of who gets to be the expert in decisions about education. Because sometimes people will come to a meeting, but they don't feel that their voice is valued, or the meeting is often a maybe a one-way conversation where the district leaders are saying, here's our plan, all right, sounds good, you, you know, as opposed to a meaningful reciprocal conversation. And those, those take time, those take resources, and also take a, a type of belief th that all voices value and should be included in making decisions about the common good of the district. Okay, so that brings us to your research, which you mm -hmm. recently concluded 
And uh, why don't you give a brief overview of what you tried to find out and then what you discovered? Yeah, so um, a study that I worked on using data that was collected by a, a statewide team, the Local Control Funding Formula Research Collaborative, which I should mention were led by a number of outstanding researchers, Julie Kopik, Dan Humphrey, Julie Marsh, I have to shout them out. Um, but drawing on data from the LCFFRC, um, I and some of my co-authors, we explored the question, we're like, all right, what is the relationship between these two equity mechanisms, the resource allocation, these additional funds for high need students and the community engagement? And then how do those two things relate to the beliefs about equity that are voiced within the district? So this would be useful information to any school district that's trying to do a better job mm -hmm. of reconciling those two goals. Yeah, and what we found is we think that there are, we found some evidence using sort of looking at these eight districts and looking at their processes in depth, we saw that there are mutually reinforcing relationships among these three processes. So in districts that had really deep, meaningful engagement with two-way conversations, intentional outreach to historically underrepresented communities, communities of color, low-income communities, those districts also had these strong district-wide equity visions that were articulated that everyone in the district could speak to, this is what we believe about equity. Um, and they were also allocating their resources in very targeted ways. So giving more funds to the schools that were serving the highest populations of low-income students. So we saw that pattern. The other pattern was kind of the opposite. Districts that didn't have a common understanding of equity across the organization. Districts that had minimal engagement. They would have these meetings and they'd say, we don't know why people aren't showing up. And we'd ask the community and they're like, all they do is talk about their PowerPoint. <laughs> like, why would we show up? Um, and then also in terms of their resource allocation strategies, those districts tended to spread the money equally across the district. So restore a music program that was equal in every school without sort of a thought to a equitable distribution that might vary a bit across students or across schools. So they were falling on the old, uh, give everybody something and mm -hmm. therefore everybody will be happy, which really works against the idea of equity because some groups need more. Yeah, at least against the idea of equity as defined in LCFF. I think for some of these folks, they were really saying equity means all or equity means it should be the same for everyone. And so that really points to the fact that the term equity is ambiguous and isn't, and, and part of why it's important for leaders to really engage in the conversation within themselves and with other people in their school, their district organization. What do we all mean when we, when we talk about equity and what does that look like in our practice? Uh, but by having uh, a, a clearly defined set of goals and a theme uh, that can guide you in making those kinds of tough decisions. Because mm -hmm. not everyone's going to be happy with the decision to get less than yeah. somebody else. So let's expand this now and bring in uh, our two recent doc doctors. Uh, I was going to say doctoral students, but you both have uh, um, graduated from our uh, doctoral program here at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, you each studied uh, this topic also. Yes, closely. Yes, my, my topic is actually very related to what you just spoke on. In fact, my first... I, sh I should mention that... You haven't known each other before, we have not, so, so we're <laughs> exactly, educating each other Exactly. Here. Okay. Um, my, the title of my dissertation was uh, is Implementation of the Local Control and Accountability Plan, a case study. And so probably one of the, distri the districts that you researched was also a district that I did my case study in because I actually walked away with a lot of great ideas to be able to take away from looking at a district that is implementing their LCAP plan and what are the next steps in regards to successes they may have, challenges, as well as the equitable practices that they're actually implementing. And so my research was focused on that particular school district with hopes of taking away key factors that we could then replicate across the state to be able to then use in other school districts to actually move past just the writing of this extensive plan, the budgeting of the money, and moving right into the implementation. And then also being able to measure your implementation because we all know there's a lot of efforts that go into writing these extensive plans, but sometimes they just live on a shelf and they, they have all sorts of great ideas, but whether or not the implementation happens um, isn't necessarily the case, which then leads to still inequitable practices that are happening in school districts, even though they may have had the best intentions behind the plan that they wrote. And your study was a case study of a single district. Yes. So it wasn't intended to be generalizable about what other school districts are doing, but 
by using qualitative methods, you could focus on what were successful here and then try those out and apply them to other school districts as future research, which we hope that you'll do yes, at some point. Yes, exactly. So I had the opportunity to uh, to actually interview stakeholders as well as district administrators and teachers. And the particular school district where I did the research really focused on that in community engagement piece. They actually did a whole PR piece around um, parents' voice matters, stakeholders' mm -hmm. voice matters. Um, even, you know, captured that in social media. Um, I got the opportunity to attend many of their stakeholder meetings where it wasn't just the checkbox of compliance of, we have a few people in the room that we're now sharing our plan. It truly was, um, I would say, 50 to 70 people in the room sharing their ideas about what could be done to improve improve the school district. With. So what was the trick? How do you get 50 to 70 people in the room? You know, I think when talking, um, when talking with the stakeholders in this particular school district, they seemed um, the, the relationship piece was huge. Um, the superintendent all the way down to the teachers were actually very interested in having the parents and the community share their experiences. And so um, they always provided the, the um, opportunity to hear the information in their primary language. So all the meetings were always translated um, and their voice was also translated in the meetings. And really it was designed in a forum of um, our voice matters. It wasn't that someone was talking to them the entire time. It was truly um, the opportunity to share what they felt could be done to be able to improve their, their school district. And so I think that relationship building from all levels, um, not just the email or the letter in the mail, it truly was a personal invitation to um, many folks to get them in the room. And it was genuine. And, it was genuine. Uh, the, the folks, uh, the, the community members, uh, recognized that and thus uh, trusted the process. Yes, and really felt that there was always um, follow through with an answer, not always what they wanted, but they felt like their interests were being addressed in some way or another, not just you know on a survey that maybe nobody read. They really felt like the school district would address it and um, be able to give them some information about why something made it into the budget or why something did not. Mm -hmm. Do you want to respond to that at all? Uh, I mean, I just I would be so excited to read your findings. It sounds like such a such a fabulous study. And something that that makes me think of the conversation around sort of the next steps and measuring outcomes sort of um, makes me think of a finding that we had that part of helping the community feel valued and increasing their engagement in the process is feeling like their input leads to some sort of tangible action. And so I sort of see a relationship between the quality and meaningfulness of engagement and these efforts to, to measure the, the actual, like what is actually happening as a result of this input and what um, outcomes is that leading to? And I think that would be called efficacy. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And Rosario, why don't you tell us about how uh, your research uh, fits in with uh, what we've heard so far? Okay. And so my, my study was a case study of a single elementary school, a high needs elementary school, in which the focus was trying to um, create a coherent system in pursuit of equity and excellence for all students. And they had just received um, the school improvement grant mm -hmm. from the state level. And so a lot of the findings that I found is the lack of resources in terms of um, high quality teacher, in terms of school resources for students. And so through um, my research, I was able to find and conclude the needs that are um, needed for a high needs community, such as, you know, um, additional personnel, meaning counselors, um, coaches for teachers, um, time for teachers to learn um, and, and really understand their pedagogy. Because we um, the school that I studied um, had a lot of veteran teachers. And so there was um, not the continuous um, learning in their own professional careers taking place. Um, also, just um, being able to provide if it was after school interventions or if it was some type of um, resources for the classroom. That is something that um, I was able to attain from my study. And how did you find that out? What did, did you interview them? 
I, I interviewed several people. So um, I interviewed the administrators from the site, the academic coaches, also district administrators that oversaw the school um, improvement efforts. I also did a focus group of teachers, parents, and um, other staff members. Okay, so what would each of you recommend as uh, next steps uh, in addressing this issue of school funding uh, and local control? And I know there's some political uh, developments also that might influence this. Who would like to start? I would say an implementation team um, is one of the pieces that I found in my findings um, to be really important. It, as far as once a plan is in place, it can't just be the one person who wrote that plan. It truly is about the accountability of involving the community and the involvement of principals, involvements of other directors. It should be that if we all agree that these are the great equitable practices that we should be offering to our students, we need to hold each other accountable for making sure that we're spending the dollars where we say we're going to spend them. And then we actually have the opportunity to implement these practices and use something like implementation science or improvement science to really dig in to figure out what we're doing well and use the data to then continue to improve. Was this something we want to continue to spend our dollars on? Because oftentimes school districts will use a budget um, that rolls over every year and they continue to spend money the same way. And so we need to do a better job at holding each other accountable for making sure that these equitable practices are actually building student success in our schools. So this is a data, data collection effort and it's it's not something that could just be done in addition to everything else. It really has to be uh, directly focused upon. Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, you work in South Whittier. What does South Whittier do? With regards to so uh, we are getting better at doing needs assessments each year and actually taking a look at what are the the programming areas where we have strengths and what are those areas where we need to do a little better and really capitalizing on our strengths like let's continue to do that well and those other areas where we just need a little more effort to push ourselves over let's put our dollars there so that we can start to make a difference and see not only practices changing in the classroom as far as student engagement, but then also you hope that that's going to be um, apparent on our California dashboard and in other ways as well. Okay. How about, uh, what recommendations would you have for going forward? My recommendations would be along with um, accountability, it's really maintaining that focus, the vision. It's always, everything that we do must be tied to that vision. If we say um, the initiative is going to be on literacy, that all our efforts um, go closely tied to, to that vision and just continue to monitor, you know, and, and continue on that path. Do not stray away from it because in education, you know, they, teachers have millions of things that they need to accomplish, but we need to stay focused and mindful on what's important and what's going to make a difference. So we and, have to be careful not to be just a bunch of words or some report that's stuck on a shelf somewhere and sent to the state, but that we truly believe in, in implementing that and we're going to stick to that strategy. Right. Which is a different way of thinking for some school districts. Yes. And, and schools. Dr. Albright, what do you see as a next step? Uh, I think there's there sort of two um, lines of the conversation. So is there sort of my hearing from the three of us? And one has to do with sort of the need for resources and how when resources are available, how they can really be used in meaningful ways that, su that support young people. Talking about how um, the temporary school improvement grant, the SIG grant, could be used in all of these really powerful ways. How, um, how district leaders can utilize LCFF funds in, the, in these powerful ways for their community. And so part of that sort of speaks to the importance of of increasing school funding. And there are, speaking to your question about like future politi political points, there's gonna be at least one initiative on the ballot um, in California next November, a year from now, um, to increase funding for schools. Uh, that would be the split role where mm -hmm. we, the limit on tax increases would still apply to residents but businesses would uh, would pay more of an appreciation. Correct, and so I think one thing that's important for California voters to do is really um, 
pay attention to this conversation around school funding and to the arguments around the upcoming ballot initiative. There's another one that where signatures are being gathered that might also end up on the ballot. So um, I think paying attention to that conversation is important for everyone. Um, as for leaders who are making the decisions about these funds, I think what, what both of you have spoken to is sort of how your dissertations and the process of this engaged practitioner scholarship um, strengthened your ability to think deeply and lead others in the allocation of resources. And so I, I think this really speaks to um, how taking a scholar practitioner stance, whether it's through something like improvement science or continuous improvement, whether it's through the process of a doctoral dissertation, but the, the value of that level of critical data-based inquiry for resource allocation, I think was really, really brought up today. So when you entered our doctoral program a few years back, surely you didn't imagine you would be studying school funding formulas, did you? No, no. that was not the plan. <laughs> so, so what happened, the listener who might be considering entering our program, you know, what happens to fuel your uh, interest into something that the average person might think uh, is uh, arcane or uh, uh, too esoteric? You know, we were told pretty early on in the program to make sure that whatever you chose your topic on, you needed to be passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And I think um, what, what we found was is that even though we came into the program maybe thinking about one particular topic, we were exposed to so many opportunities to learn about research um, around the educational field that you really don't have the opportunity to do um, in your everyday in and out life. And the balance to be reading the research and then really reflecting on it and applying it to your daily practice and your work, you really start to find your passions that you didn't necessarily know that you had at the beginning of the program. And so I was always thinking about evidence-based practices. And then that just really started to manifest itself into social justice and equity for, for our students. And that is always tied to dollars because we do practices really related to where dollars are spent. And, and so, it costs money to do the kinds of things that, exactly. you, that are necessary to get us exactly. over that bar. Okay, uh, how about you? And for me, you know, being a school principal, I'm always looking for ways to better the lives of my students, our students of color. And so I wanted to make sure that my study focused on how can we develop a system where we know that students that come to us with all different types of factors that we can make a difference. If they are given the opportunity, they can rise to the occasion. And so that is why I became so passionate about looking for a system like that and the coherent system, the coherent framework is what I use from Michael Follin and Quinn that really helped to gauge um, what I was looking for so I can implement that same change in my site. So I think one of the common things I'm hearing is that we have a practitioner-oriented program where there are doctoral programs that tend more toward the theoretical, we try and re reunite the, the theory and practice in a way that it's useful for an aspiring school administrator. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, originally when signing up for the program, you, you, you know that there's this daunting dissertation ahead of you. But at the same time, um, I think it was a true reflection of practice for the three years that we were enrolled in the program, that it wasn't just about the end result. It was about the leader we were becoming through the, through the process. And it was very relevant. You know, it really made a difference on which way or what, what is my next step? You know, what do I need to be mindful when I'm making certain decisions for my site and for my students. So it was very relevant, our day-to-day -to, -day to work. And Dr. Albright, I will give you the final word. As a, as a newcomer to the faculty mm -hmm. in educational leadership, uh, what do you take from this discussion about how these uh, doctoral students and now doctors uh, found their, their uh, scholastic interest? Mm. Yeah, this is making me think about how there's often a difference between sort of like the, the problem or the passion and the actual specific research question. And I think what we ask of our doctoral students coming in is that you have that, that passion, you have that problem, you're, that sticky problem you're trying to figure out, like that you have that. And what we offer through a scholar practitioner lens is the opportunity to develop the types of research skills and background knowledge to turn that passion into a concrete question. So your passion is about equity, is about social justice, is about advancing excellence for your students. But then we can help you be like, you can 
address that through a question about the implementation of a finance policy, right? And so making that connection is where I think doctoral training really, really comes into play. Right. So uh, if you're at all interested, uh, viewers, uh, we are always looking for uh, applicants to our doctoral program and our master's program uh, and our credentials program in uh, educational leadership. Uh, good people uh, like Dr. Albright and lots of uh, other professors. And if you're at all interested to check the, the website at Cal Poly Pomona College of Education and Integrative Studies. Thank you for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you.